You are listening to Arcane Carolinas, an exploration of the Carolinas' folklore, legends, myths, and modern weird. Each episode, we examine the historical context of our topic and aim to preserve some of the stories that help make this part of the world such a fascinating place. Hello and welcome to a summer episode of Arcane Carolinas in which I have definitely not been talking about my recent haircut for the last 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm your co-host, Charlie Mushaw, and I just got a haircut. I am your other co-host, award-winning novelist, Michael G. Williams, and I am getting a haircut tomorrow. So, hey, look at that. Getting ready for Congregate. Haircuts all around. All right. We'd like to start by saying thank you to our Patreon backers. As always, I am fully aware that the July video is late. I posted something on the Patreon page as to why, and we will get that to you. It will get done. And the topic for today's episode comes from a recent short trip I took to Charlotte, North Carolina. Originally, I thought maybe we'll sit on this until the fall, but I really want to share the story while it's fresh and plug the local businesses I came across because... It was a really fun trip. Yeah, I keep almost hearing this story, and then you're like, no, I've got to save everything, and so I am (laughs) very ready to hear it. All right. So I I went to Charlotte with big plans, big plans, me and the wife. We went, and we were like, all right, this is going to be great. We're going to do all this stuff. We did very little of that stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Because what happened was we wound up spending an entire day, six hours in the Sleepy Poet Antique Mall. Are you familiar at all? No, I've never heard of the Sleepy Poet Antique Mall. So Sleepy Poet Antique Mall, which is at sleepypoetantiquemall.com. They're also on Instagram. We'll put them in the show notes. I went to the Charlotte location. It looks like they also have one in Castonia. If you like old and odd things, it is so amazing. It's huge. The booths are good. Most of the vendors have really good to some have great pricing. Hmm. You know how sometimes you go to an antique mall and the vendors are basically, it's just eBay prices and that's not really fun. Yeah. This is not that. So perfect example. I went in looking for some vintage comic books. I was looking for a very specific couple of comics and I left with a (laughs) U-Haul. Like a truck. Yeah. That I rented. (laughs) Did you fill it with comic books? It was not filled with comic books. In fact, I bought two comic books and the rest was some mid-century modern furniture that was priced at a quarter of what you would pay either online or at a more specialized furniture store. Sure. Like super awesome stuff. I also, I I don't need to go through all the things that I bought. My point is that Sleepy Poet Antique Mall, (laughs) if you're willing to dig a little bit, has some vendors that offload things at incredibly fair prices. Would you describe it as legitimately a dedicated antiques mall? Or is this sort of halfway between an antiques place and like a thrift store slash junk store slash secondhand store? Oh, uh, it's it's dedicated. It, it's very much a dedicated antique mall. Cool. It's really cool. So if you like crawling through antique malls or like you said, thrifting or, you know, flea marketing. Yeah. It has can't pass it up finds in there. There was stuff that I wanted to get that I couldn't because I was like, well, I've already spent X amount of dollars and I, I had intended to spend this much. I've gone ahead and spent that much and rented a truck i'll put it to you this way so one of the things that i bought it was cheaper for me to rent a truck buy the thing and drive it back myself it would have been cheaper for me to hire a mover (laughs) to do it than it would to have bought this thing in uh, raleigh for example like if i had gone to a place in raleigh and found a comparable piece of furniture i would have paid like three times as much yeah Anyways, Sleepy Poet Antique Mall, Charlotte, North Carolina. It's super awesome. You should check it out. And while there, I bought a t-shirt from Spooky CLT. Spooky CLT is going to be on an upcoming, it may have already aired by the time we talk about this Case Files episode. It's a husband and wife duo that's into spooky stuff, and they focus on history and lore around Charlotte, North Carolina. I didn't even realize that it was their t-shirt when I bought it. (laughs) (laughs) It was just a cool shirt. And what's interesting is that they are the source of today's story. They, on Instagram, 
saw that I was in Charlotte because I posted a thing to, to Instagram, like, yeah, checking stuff out in Charlotte. They liked it. They commented and they sent me all these great leads for stuff to check out. We got to talk to them and they were super, super nice and really, really love talking about spooky stuff in Charlotte and are really good at digging up the past that is otherwise sort of hard to notice in Charlotte because like we talked about with them, so much of Charlotte appears to have been built basically last week. Yes, <laughs> or is currently under construction. Yeah. And I would like to plug one final Charlotte business. So we've done Sleepy Pony Antique Mall, Spooky CLT, and I really want to thank the mystery lady from Carolina History and Haunts. <laughs> We will get into to the mystery lady a little bit later, but she was she was great. And Carolina History and Haunts Ghost Tours in Charlotte, North Carolina. Cool. I'm going to jump in to plug a different but similar Charlotte business, which is Klein's. It is north of Charlotte. It's outside of Charlotte. It's north of Harrisburg on North Carolina 49. It's kind of an antique small and it's kind of a junk store and it's kind of a thrift place or a flea market, it's hard to describe. Other than to say, there are multiple permanent buildings that are just chock full of anything you can think of. Furniture, appliances, dolls, books, toys, clothes, you name it. And a lot of them are really gorgeous, beautiful, really cool antiques. And then there are probably a dozen like tractor trailer trailers behind it that are just full of stuff that nobody's been through yet. Oh, man, that's where you find the good stuff. Yeah, like maybe that stuff is trash, but maybe it's not. And you just got to climb some steps into them and go poke around to see. And in the meantime, every now and then there are these mannequins propped up around the place in chairs wearing some of the clothes that are on offer. So occasionally you'll turn a corner into a dark warehouse and there is just a figure <laughs> seated with its back to you. And you find yourself wondering, is that a person? Did I walk in on them having like a meditative moment or is that another mannequin? It's a lot of fun. I really love Klein's. It's kind of creepy and it's kind of amazing. Gotten some really fun stuff there. They also have a bunch of like wrought iron and yard art and all kinds of weird stuff. And nothing has a price on it at Klein's. You have to take it to the circle of old men in beach chairs. <laughs> and you have to sort of present it to them and they consult with one another in their own language. And then one of them will state a number and that is what it costs. I have a new life goal. I want to either have a place like that of my own or be a party to a place <laughs> like that. Klein's is really great. Oh, here's something. I oh, yeah. My inappropriate mug <laughs> that I will not talk about. I got a delightful, inappropriate uh, piece of milk glass. Uh, it's a mug. Accidentally inappropriate. Drink. Yes, it's it's the best kind. Yes. So anyway. Charlotte, North Carolina, county seat of Mecklenburg County, most populous city in the state, and 15th most populous city in the entire U.S. Oh, I didn't realize it was that high on the list. Yeah, I didn't either. Thanks, Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Before this summer, like when we went out there for Con Carolinas, I hadn't really taken the time to kick around Charlotte in probably 10 years. I had been there previously for an event, and in that time, there's a lot of new stuff there. Yeah, when we met, my husband lived in Charlotte, and so we spent a lot of time in Charlotte. And most of the time, we didn't go to what I think of as downtown, but I know is called Uptown. We didn't go to Uptown very often, but when we did, it was always like, oh, this is actually really nice. We have a favorite place to get dinner in Uptown, and then we'd go see a show or something like that and have a lot of fun. So today's story is not about anything new in Charlotte. In fact, it's about the famous or infamous historic hotel the dunhill are you familiar with that one i have never heard of it dunhill is a historic hotel and we're going to get into its history it's a nice place elvis presley stayed there paul mccartney stayed there he, he stayed on the uh the top the top floor i found somebody saying that when he played an arena in charlotte that that's where he stayed it's got a really interesting history like on its own it's got some good ghost stories and i went there and i talked to the staff and did some exploring of a dubious legality <laughs> i mean I, I figured i'd bought a drink so that entitled me to explore the place right yeah yeah that's the social contract like i i paid you for this cocktail therefore i am entitled full reign of your facility <laughs> that's certainly an attitude i've exhibited in various establishments in the past 
The staff was great. But like I said, it has a really interesting history. So we will go all the way back to origins of not just the hotel, but the property that it sits on because I have a going theory. So it sits on the corner of West 6th and North Tryon Street. Hotel was originally called Mayfair Manor. It was built in 1929 and financed by two doctors who were famous as the founders of the Charlotte Ear, Nose, and Throat Hospital. Doctors J.P. Matheson and C.N. Peeler. But where the Mayfair Manor Hotel was built is on a site formerly occupied by the Tryon Street Methodist Episcopal Church, which had purchased the property in 1862 from some dude named Joel Huggins for 2300 bucks. And I, we will have a lot of sources in the show notes on this because I did not find all this on my own. There are a lot of people that have put work into preserving the history of this building. So we'll be sure to give them all credit in the show notes. The Tryon Street Methodist Episcopal Church sold the property to the Home Real Estate and Guarantee Company on May 5th, 1926 for $250,000. So they turned a bit of a profit. That's some big money back then. Yes, huge money. So here's where it gets weird for me. So you had a church. Obviously, churches have cemeteries. There's a cemetery right around the corner on Church Street, less than a quarter mile away, that I think is that has its own stories. But what I couldn't find was whether or not this church had a cemetery on their own grounds that you could tie in to some ghost stories. There's no record of that. Hmm. What is on record is that the Home Real Estate and Guarantee Company did not sit on it for long, and they flipped it that same year, not two months later, to the doctors. So enter the doctors that want to build this hotel. I'm getting big Shandor vibes from <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> It was sold to them with the provision that the church had the right to remove any detachable personal property, you know, like stuff that was theirs inside of the building. Sure. The real estate company basically handed the church a bunch of money. The church left all their stuff there. Part of the deal from the real estate company was that the church could get all their stuff out when they were ready, and they had the right to retain the church and Sunday school buildings without rent for 18 months. So basically, the doctors buy this plot of land that has all this stuff already on it. And people said, give us 18 months to get out of the way while you make your plans. And the doctors were like, yeah, OK. OK, yeah. So it kind of makes sense when you look at it that way. Jump ahead two years to 1928, and they had hired an architect, a Charlotte-based architect named Louis Asbury, to design the hotel. And fun fact, the current restaurant is named after him. Oh. It is the Asbury. Good deal. And this agreement is listed as job number 723 in Asbury's log of jobs, dated September 28th, 1928, describing it as an apartment slash hotel. I mean, at the time, a lot of hotels had semi-permanent guests slash residents. Right. One of my like weird things that I really want to do is like my mega millions dreams. Like if I won the lottery would be like, just live in a fancy hotel for a month. Totally. Like just be the eccentric on the top floor living in the hotel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then you get ghost stories named after you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> what's crazy is that a year later it was done. Wow. Which feels crazy fast. The date of entry for the design and accepting the job was September 1928. And then in November of 1929, they were like, all right, check it out. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> this was a big project with a lot of people working on it. And the final build was a 10-story, 100-room hotel intended for use by both permanent and transient guests with 50 rooms reserved for those permanent residents that you mentioned, as was the style at the time. Yep. And its location was pretty great for permanent residents or guests, I guess, because it was within two blocks of the city square. It was close to the business district. It was walkable to things that people at the time would need. Mm -hmm. It had its own restaurant, too, but right, by, right nearby were stores. Stores, the library, the theater, cafes, bakeries, churches, everything you could need was within two blocks of this hotel. And it was an absolute bright spot in the news for Charlotte because it was finished in the wake of the stock market crash. Yeah. So it was creating jobs. It was very fancy. It was sort of a a shining bright beacon of hope in some ways because the the tile and the marble work was meant to be an exact replica of the Atlanta's Biltmore Hotel. So they brought in high-end skilled workers. The tile floor of the dining room was some kind of new like wonder material called tile techs. <laughs> Guaranteed for a lifetime service at low initial cost. No maintenance required. Wow. Tile techs. <laughs> yeah. 
I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it was all sourced locally, too. The furnishings came right from in town from McCoy's Furniture on South Tryon Street. They had some sort of weird contraption installed called the Iron Fireman. Wow. <laughs> Which was an automated stoker furnace. Interesting, weird stuff. Hmm. Come for the tile techs, stay for the Iron Fireman. <laughs> Sounds like a Doctor Who monster. <laughs> right. It's like the antagonist in Mike Milligan and the Steam Shovel. It's yes. like the new the, the new <laughs> thing. It's the, oh, the new Iron Fireman's putting the old fire, <laughs> Iron Fireman out of business. All right, I'm done. <laughs> the Charlotte Observer did a big, big like thing on it and called it impressive, modern, luxurious, and massive. <laughs> I'm reading that in like, oh, tiny radio voice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, come on down. It's impressive, modern, luxurious, and massive. The Mayfair Hotel, built by the doctors. You know them from the ear, nose, and throat hospital. Why'd they build a hotel? Nobody knows. Probably money. Probably. Or the occult. That also I, works. That's a good reason for I just about anything. <laughs> I still weirded out that like there's no mention of the cemetery being moved because churches had their own cemeteries. Anyway, this, this specific article that the Charlotte Observer did, this big unveiling, was a super valuable source of information about the original design and interior of Mayfair Manor. The reporter does a whole tour of the building. The lobby is described as impressive. The floors were, I might be pronouncing this wrong. You, you're a man of culture and class. <laughs> Correct me. If I'm wrong, terrazzo. Yeah, terrazzo. Okay. So the floors were uh, terrazzo with a tile base. The walls were covered with a material called craft X. Tile tax, <laughs> craft X. There's a lot of like right. stuff X going on there. <laughs> right. You know what letter in the alphabet doesn't get used a lot? <laughs> X. <laughs> Let's put it on things. Yeah. There was a lot of intricately carved woodworking in walnut, and the fixtures were made out of bronze. It had a massive fireplace as a focal point in the lobby, which was a thing to do in a lobby. Mm -hmm. uh, we get into that a little bit with another episode in the fall where there's a big fireplace. Uh, yeah. I don't want to give too much mm -hmm. away. Different hotel. Also had a big fireplace. Yeah. And it was in this tastefully decorated lobby that one might also purchase cigars, cigarettes, and a fine confection known as Martha Washington candy. What was Martha Washington candy? I have no idea, like? but apparently the Mayfair Manor had an exclusive contract to be the only provider in Charlotte. And that okay. was a big selling point in the article. They're like, come on down and get your Martha Washington candy. <laughs> if I can find a link to an explanation of it, I'll put that in the show notes. <laughs> it's little bits of wood, honey dipped wood. <laughs> I don't know. But beneath the lobby on 6th Street, they also had a barber shop and a lounge where guests could just chill hang out they had big french doors marking the entrance into the dining room for the restaurant and the decor within the restaurant matched the walnut and bronze motif of the lobby so you know you very much still felt like you were in the hotel it wasn't like a separate thing arched windows on the front which are still there they're pretty cool the wall coverings again craft decks were were used the restaurant which is interesting that that was like fancy enough to mention and it also said in soft colors Soft, soft colors. colors so i'm picturing easter egg pastels <laughs> yeah uh, you know soothing for me yes. time. no neon uh <laughs> black and brown checkered tile text floor was meant to give the dining room an air of dignity yeah they're going for that you know luxurious comforting emotionally undisturbing kind of thing like reading the description i can picture it in my head i'm like big throwback gatsby-esque hotel super nice super fancy totally. the kitchen was apparently really legit too the latest in cooking conveniences a sampling of the original kitchen inventory from the article they had an electric dishwasher which was a big deal yeah Ooh. they had a sterilizer with get this a five thousand dish capacity what? i'm envisioning just like a walk-in fridge except that it's a steam room and they just steam Yeah, them. I mean, this is it's a pretty big Hobart, yeah, you know? pretty awesome. Steam tables, electric potato peelers, electric mixing machines. They really invested heavily into the kitchen because they wanted it to be completely self-sufficient. They wanted it to be, everything to be able to be produced in-house. They wanted a bakery in there. They wanted, like, everything at the hotel to be able to run in its own self-contained bubble. It's worth noting that they did take the workers into great consideration and invested heavily in the ventilation system. And it would cycle out the air every three minutes completely, which is pretty cool. Wow. I mean, I've, I've worked in, in restaurant kitchens and, you know, that sounds delightful. Yeah. They also had a skylight put into the kitchen ceiling just for the benefit of the workers. Oh, yeah, that's good. I, I, it's like I'm reading all this. I'm like, this sounds like an amazing place to work in 1929. <laughs> Yeah, because a lot of kitchens are, frankly, right. dungeon. 
Um, and as I mentioned, there they had plans. They were going to put an in-house bakery in. They had a. Spe- <laughs> they describe it in this article as a salad department. So in wow. the kitchen, in this massive kitchen, they had an entire segment that was like, oh, that's the salad department. They also right. had a dessert department. Pretty so impressive. This giant industrial kitchen. Pretty cool. Further driving home how this is a like a nice place. The rooms in this era, each one had its own bathroom, which is a big deal. They each had a mm-hmm. radio, which is a big deal. And they each had a phone, which is like a huge deal. Yeah, those are all pretty impressive and unusual technologies or comforts for a hotel of the era. And the rooms were interesting in that they were all set up initially in living room style. So you walk in and there's like a table, like a sitting table table and chairs and stuff and they actually use murphy beds oh so you could get a double or a twin those were the two two types of beds that they had and you know they'd be up until you needed them so you'd like you know chill in your living room until it was time to go to bed and then you'd pull your bed down the 10th floor was a penthouse it was broken into two units apparently had a nice view at the time the city's kind of been built up i'm i'm sure it still has An interesting view, but not the same sort of like long into the distance thing that it would have had. Yeah, I would imagine the skyline is very different now. This all sounds super nice, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, it is the Great Depression and suicide rates are going up and it is a very tall building for the time and you could get a room and people jumped out the windows. (laughs) Wow. So it became the suicide hotel. Yes. So the 10th floor, like I mentioned, private residence, two units. So the highest you could get was the ninth floor. And allegedly, staff began reporting odd happenings shortly after the hotel opened, which to me drives home like, well, was it built on a cemetery? Or is it because people kept throwing themselves off the ninth floor? Yeah. These days, room 906 specifically is said to be a focal point of strange activity. But we'll get to that. We're still in history mode. The way way this is going to work is I'm going to do history of the hotel because it's a very interesting history. Then we'll do the legends and then we'll do my experience there. Sure. One of the doctors, Dr. Matheson, dies in 1937 and the property is acquired they let it go to a corporation the mayfair realty corporation in 1959 so they held on to it for a while and just ran it and managed it as apartments and hotel in 1959 the mayfair realty corporations sold the property to dwight phillips and mr phillips sunk two hundred twenty five thousand dollars into it in renovations because you know if it hadn't been renovated in yeah more than 20 years it needed some updates renovations improvements and then turned around a year later and transferred it to his corporation dl phillips building company basically took a hit bought the thing used it as a tax write-off to make it better transferred it to a corporation and changed the name to the james lee motor inn so sinks money into it rebrands it and buys the property to the rear of the hotel apparently there was a plot behind it that was not a part of the original purchase agreement and he picked that up and sort of ties it all in together as one big piece of property and they ran it for a really long time until december of 1980 it gets really crazy again it's a very nice hotel been there the staff is super nice it's got a checkered past has changed hands a lot (laughs) and a lot of weird stuff happens there so the whole lot gets sold off in december of 1980 and just kicks off the most ridiculous string of unproductive acquisitions Also, it was sold for 300 grand. So I feel like they sunk money into it and then just rode that investment until it was falling apart. Yeah, it sounds like maybe it was not in great shape at that time. No, from what I read was that it has kind of in disrepair and becoming a bit of a flop house. Oh, what is that? The Cecil Hotel in Los Angeles, built around the same time. Big Cecil Hotel vibes. So A.B. Wilkins Jr. in 1980 owns a company called Delta Capital. They buy it. They had hoped to turn it into condos. They were going to fix it up, turn it into condos and and try to flip it. But that did not go well. (laughs) (laughs) And there was a bit of a bad blood thing between Wilkins and a dude named Charles Kennard who had hoped to get in on this conversion as a partner. They got into a very public fight where one was filing newspaper articles looking for new partners while the other one still owned it. (laughs) 
Oh, uh, and that's pretty yeah, rough. Basically, nothing happened, and Wilkins kicked everybody out. He went around, posted signs all in the interior of the hotel, which was more functioning, like I said, as a flop house now. Said everybody has to get out by October 1st, 1981. We're also not doing condos, we're doing a luxury hotel. So, October 1st, 1981, the place is vacated, the building sits empty, and neither of their plans come to fruition. The James Lee Motor Inn is sold on January 4th, 1982 for $392,000 to an investment firm out of the Netherlands Antilles. Okay. And they, yeah, Mm. they wanted to turn it into office condos. And they said that they were going to get it done by summer of that year. That did not happen because they decided it would be cheaper, more profitable to just turn it back into a hotel proper, like a upscale fancy hotel. And then said, okay, well, we're not going to be able to get that done until 1983 so they set like they did the project planning they're like all right we'll have that done by 83 that did not happen (laughs) so the structure stood vacant basically for almost the entire 80s a guy named Bert Gelman who was apparently a restaurateur in Charlotte tried to buy it because he hated that it sat empty and they did not accept his bid Uh, the Elko Corporation the the foreign foreign company Mm -hmm. did not accept his bid and he took it to court because apparently they like everything was in order and they like at the last second were just like no and he was like like, but we had a deal i went to court in 1985 and the elko corporation retained ownership so he lost the suit Uh, in 1986 it was sold to an investment company called fallswood investment they turned around and sold it a couple months later in december of 86 to omni swiss properties so the thing is just changing hands nobody knows what to do with it it's sitting in charlotte empty and then the heroes of the story emerge the duck <laughs> if there can be heroes of a story in real estate acquisition, there can. So, there can definitely be yeah. villains. So I suppose there. Can I mean, be so far guys. nobody's really a villain. It's just changing hands and nobody's doing anything with it. So then the Dunhill Hotel Associates purchased the hotel from the Omni Swiss Properties on August sixth, nineteen eighty seven, and start sinking money into it for renovations. Unfortunately, at this point, it had been empty since nineteen eighty one. Homeless people use it as a place to live. Addicts use it as a place to get high. Basically, no one really knew who exactly was coming and going from eighty one to eighty seven. The police department just knew it as a place they were aware of but it didn't make sense to bother the people you know what i mean yeah so right not great things happening in there and this was further driven home during renovations when a skeleton was found in the elevator shaft so the headline from the february 10th 1988 charlotte observer reads workers find skull and bones in former hotel's basement. Yikes. So while cleaning out an elevator shaft near the basement boiler room, a worker named George Neal, a laborer for the D.L. Rogers Construction Company, found a human skeleton in pieces. So the clothing was still present. Uh, forensic experts determined that the bones belonged to an elderly Caucasian man, approximately five foot eight, likely walked with a limp and had a distinctly malformed left hand. Okay. Uh, a police officer was quoted in the observer story indicating that he had known from just work in the street that multiple homeless people lived in there Uh, it was you know a trouble spot that they kind of looked the other way on the exact quote is this was one of their favorite spots that body could have been buried down there for god knows how long that's attributed to officer eg blue of the charlotte metropolitan police department nothing like speaking honestly so i mean it's a skeleton right yeah so it's just just like so stories focusing on the discovery appeared in the local media twice at that time and in one of those stories they got a medical examiner to go on record and say that the man had died sometime between two and five years before the discovery of the body putting it you know roughly 83 to 86 there was a reporter in 2013 that reached out to the cmpd homicide division and said hey i'm doing a story on the bones found in the dunhill can you give me any updates and homicide detective tech who i'm guessing is like a csi person i don't yeah i don't know talked to the reporter and said you know depending on the conditions you'd be surprised at how rapidly tissue can decompose off of a skeleton if you're in an elevator shaft in an un air conditioned or un hvac building you're going to get extreme heat you're going to get extreme cold what that technician also said i'll attribute the name christy osor 
Osorio. So Christy Osorio also said they were able to determine after checking records for the reporter that the individual was never positively identified. No one was charged in any relationship to the case. And basically a physically challenged elderly man, likely homeless, with no family or friends to miss him, either fell or was pushed down the elevator shaft Yeah, where he died. There's a phenomenon referred to as the missing a missing. There are people who disappear, but mm-hmm. nobody notices. And yeah. it's estimated that there are as many missing missing as there are missing people. It's just terrifying yeah. today. Osario also went on to say that she could not find records of what happened to the bones. Whoops. Yep. So maybe they were shipped somewhere for storage and later examination. Maybe they were donated to science. They could have been buried in a potter's field. Destroyed, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. It did happen. We'll post pictures of the newspaper clippings on the Facebook page and the gallery for this to have show notes, links to these articles. I have a theory on how did he die uh, and why he was never missed. And uh, this is just a theory. But what if it was like a hobo? passing through like riding the rails and just dropped into town for a little bit and so nobody in town would know who he was sure or or notice him i mean there's a million explanations regardless renovations finished a new luxury hotel branded as the dunhill opens it is a landmark in town you can visit it today it's got an event space on the top floor a nice restaurant a bar in the lobby they make great cocktails traditional cocktails they're not like whispering essences into your fancy drink they will make you a good gimlet or a good old-fashioned right which is what you want in that kind of place i have to imagine that if they that when they reopened it was awfully tempting probably to have a motto of the dunhill almost no skeletons <laughs> the dunhill the sidewalks have been clean for decades. <laughs> uh, <laughs> too much. <laughs> uh, so anyway, <laughs> right. It's just not the not the happiest place on earth if you dig into the history, but it is a very nice hotel. And everything that we've covered so far has been verifiable historical fact with ex- extensive records. So let's get into the legends a little bit more. So as mentioned, room 906 is supposed to be like a focal point of paranormal activity. Yeah. One paranormal investigator that spoke with the News and Observer or the Charlotte Observer, I apologize, the Charlotte Observer in 2017 reported phenomena such as phantom smells throughout the hotel. Which was like, <laughs> yeah, I've done that trick too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? What's that? Who's the dog? In a hundred year old building, like, I don't know, how do you even classify something as being a phantom smell? So the, the, the things that this individual said was there were phantom smells, uh, electromagnetic field spikes, and drastic temperature changes. Okay. Assuming that the, the electrical work when the renovations were done was up to snuff you know there shouldn't be wild electromagnetic field spikes and temperature changes are weird yeah definitely the goings ons goings on goings on the goings on the stuff happening yes <laughs> the stuff happening <laughs> in the room <laughs> has been described as inexplicable electrical issues uh, the sounds of tapping on furniture and objects being moved so like if you put a hairbrush down and go in the other room you come back it'll be somewhere else interesting this is kind of funny to me dusty all of this is attributed to dusty the ghost (laughs) so they've got a little sort of ghostly mascot Uh uh-huh and it's like oh it's just dusty there i couldn't find any instances of apparitions being reported as being seen or tying dusty to any one actual person it's just sort of a anonymous term of endearment and way to process oh that's just dusty yeah i like that a lot those are like the main things skeleton found in the elevator shaft definitely happened multiple people reporting paranormal experiences in room 906 other people reporting paranormal experiences throughout the hotel those are the legends that surround it so i will get into my experience because i do not consider myself like a paranormal investigator i'm not running around with a with a box trying to decipher voices or anything like that. Right. So I can only explain what I experienced there, which is not anything too exciting, but I had fun. Uh, so, <laughs> so I get the tip to check out the hotel from Spooky CLT and purposely did no reading or research. I wanted to go in cold. Yeah. My wife is a great sport. Big high five to her for saying like, yeah, all right, let's go. So the plan is we're going to go to the bar. We're going to have a drink. We're going to talk to the staff and see what we can see. So we walk in. And there is an unusually high number of people crowding in the lobby bar like zombies. (laughs) 
like not a normal site for a historic hotel lobby bar where there's just like ah drinks and i'm just like what is going on and then i saw a lady in like a long nice black dress wearing a pumpkin backpack and i was like i bet that's a ghost tour (laughs) And and it was so I was like, well, I'm not waiting in that line. So we just walked up to the front desk and started talking to the staff. And we were like, is that a ghost tour? And they were like, they were, they smiled and we're like, yeah, yeah, politely. They're like, this place has a lot of history. <laughs> and, and we're like, do you want to talk about it? Right. One of them opens right up and she's like, yes. I will tell you straight up, this place is haunted. There's stuff that happens that you cannot explain. It is freaky and I hate it. I had an experience where something touched my arm and it made me uncomfortable and I ran out of the room. Uh I was just like, whoa. whoa." And I mean, she just volunteered all this stuff, like just came out with it. The other guy goes, I work at the front desk and fortunately have not had to experience any of that. That's really funny. And she actually said, she was like, you'll put something down in a room, go to another room to clean some more and come back. And then it's moved. Oof, that would creep me out. And they were super nice. They were super, super duper nice. The The front desk staff and the um, the lady that I talked to, I'm not sure what her role was at the hotel, but she was awesome. Mm-hmm. And then the, the tour group moved from the, the porting, the bar into like the little sitting lounge area, which was still there that I mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. like when they did the original floor, floor plan. Yeah. So they went over there. So they were sitting there and that was cool. Post up at the bar, order some cocktails, start talking to the bar staff. Ghost tour, huh? Yeah. And the one guy looked like, I do not want to talk about this. <laughs> and the other guy goes, yeah, I just started. I can't wait to experience something. <laughs> That's so great. And then he points at the other guy that's like, obviously like not wanting to talk. And he's like, he's experienced stuff. And the guy just like glances up and goes, "Ah, yeah, man, weird stuff. Lights, electricity. It's weird, man. Stuff happens. (laughs) (laughs) Like he did not want to talk about it, which was interesting, right? Yeah. If they were doing this purely as a marketing thing, then the people would be pressured to volunteer stories and and be really enthusiastic about it. And uh, this guy just wanted to talk to me about what bourbon I wanted in my old fashioned. Right. And like very much did not want to talk about it. So we get our drinks and they have these two really big, nice leather chairs. Like if you go down the steps to the basement where the elevator shaft is Mm -hmm. and where the barber shop was, there's these two big leather chairs and so let's just sit down there and they're not facing the elevator and this is important for my story because i cannot see into the elevator so we're sitting there we're chatting and we're like having a nice time then ding and the doors open and i guess i was just feeling some kind of way i don't know i was like in this spooky headspace my eyes just bugged out of my head when nobody immediately stepped off of it (laughs) Except that the person that was on it was just like on their phone or something and taking their time stepping off because then he did step off and I was just staring at him like (laughs) mouth half open and eyes popping out of my head. Right. And I realized that I was staring at this guy and I guess my wife was too. I wasn't even looking at her. I was just like, oh, sorry, sorry. We just heard a bunch of ghost stories about the hotel. And at this point, I don't know about the elevator shaft. Yeah. I was just like creeped out sitting down there. (laughs) He's like, yeah, dude, your eyes are real big right now. (laughs) (laughs) Did you poke him to see if he was alive? (laughs) I should have. Yes. So he's walking up the steps to go back up towards the lobby. And as that's happening, this lady in old timey clothes carrying a lantern comes around the corner from the hallway. And I'm just like, get out, get out. I am done. Like, what is going on? (laughs) Like, I am like fine tuned to just be like, what is happening? And I'm like, are you with the ghost tour? (laughs) 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 And she... (laughs) She was such a good sport. She's like, I'm with the best ghost tour. Ah. (laughs) And I was like, (laughs) she was super sweet. Did not catch her name. So I going to send the company a message and be like, hey, check it out. Carolina History and Haunts. And she's the one that actually shared with me about the elevator shaft. So I knew about it before I, I found the newspaper story. So I knew where to look. She gave me like hints and leads and it was awesome. She was like, yeah, so the elevator shaft used to be right here and like knocks on the wall. And I'm like, oh, okay. She's like, but you know, they needed to put new ones in during renovations, blah, blah, blah. And they walled it up and this is where the remains were found. I was like, oh, okay. So she went off to give a tour. I was like, well, let's go exploring. (laughs) So I got up and started knocking on the wall and was like, oh, okay. And checked out the floor plan. And you could totally still get in there if you went into the mechanical room, which I would not advocating that you do that because that would be trespassing. Right. But if you were to open the door 
to the mechanical room where the elevator controls are and the sprinkler system controls are, that is actually where the elevator shaft was prior to the new elevator being installed immediately next to it. Good to know. Just in case anybody's ever wandering around down there. Yeah. If you are a paranormal investigator, which again, I am not, I'm not claiming to be one, but if you are, that's a good tidbit to know. Yeah. So then my wife is like, let's go upstairs. And I'm like, uh, okay. (laughs) So so we just started exploring the hotel and walking around and looking at stuff. And of course, wound up outside of room 906 because I can't remember if it was the front desk staff or the Carolina History and Haunts lady, but somebody told me about room 906. Might have even been Spooky CLT. Everyone was so generous with information that I, I can't keep it straight right now as we're talking. But one of them told me about room 906. So we went up there and like a total creep, I stood outside of this room and heard people talking in there <laughs> and was like, maybe it's ghosts <laughs> or maybe it's just people on vacation and I should stop being a weirdo and standing outside of this door. (laughs) So that's what I did. And that is when I experienced a drastic shift in temperature. Really? In that hallway. Yes. It's because there was an AC vent mounted very oddly Uh, at head level. That's disappointing. (laughs) (laughs) I understand that that's not what the 2017 article was referencing. Yeah. (laughs) But... But it was funny when I read the article, I was like, oh, yeah, I had one of those. (laughs) That that falls distinctly into the normal end of paranormal. Yeah, it's just the poorly placed HVAC thing where you walk by and just blasts you in the side of the head. Yeah. (laughs) That's the Dunhill Hotel. It is wonderfully creepy and kooky and a little bit spooky. And I really wish I had stayed there instead of the hotel that I did stay at. But I didn't know about it before getting there. I think one of the things that I like most about that story is that it has a shady history that's recent. It's not, you know, there were probably bad people involved 100 years ago. It's more like what weird money laundering operations were involved in buying and selling this place and flipping it while it's theoretically empty, but is instead filled with people dying at the bottoms of elevator shafts in the 80s. You know, that's pretty living memory. Very tragic history involved in the hotel. That said, again, it is a perfectly nice space. Like if you want to check out a nice restaurant, they got one of those. If you want to stay in a nice historic hotel, that's what it is. The staff is cool. The drinks are great. I feel like I've been plugging the drinks way too hard on this episode, (laughs) but no, I had a really terrible cocktail at a rooftop bar that I'm not going to name because they don't deserve to get plugged. (laughs) So this was good. This was good. These were good people. Excellent. And they have artifacts on display. If you go into the basement directly across from where, now that I'm saying all this out loud and like hadn't really thought about it, Mm -hmm. maybe that's why it feels creepy down there. Cause like that's where the bones were found. That's where Mm -hmm. they have all these artifacts from previous iterations of the hotel sitting in a glass case. We should record an episode there. I'm into it. That would be fun. We could sit in the big chairs next to all the spooky stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm full of Charlotte ideas now. (laughs) Charlie returns to Charlotte for the first time in 10 years and comes back with, that place is great. (laughs) It beats a lot of the alternatives. That's what happens when you're cooped up and don't get to go anywhere for a year and a half. Yeah, for real. But anyway, uh, yeah, that's the Dunhill Hotel. Maybe it's been on a cemetery. Maybe it's not. They definitely had dead people there and people (laughs) jumped off the roof a lot. Yeah. The question of whether it's on top of a cemetery is moot once you start finding dead people inside it. Well, that's the thing, right? Is that, you know, we're always trying to find like possible connective tissue, right? And we're, we're, we want to find that connective tissue. And this one's just like, oh, nope, this is all, this is all weird and creepy. Yeah. This is like, oh, you don't, here's a newspaper from, you know, that probably there's still multiple copies of sitting in the back of a library. Right. Very, very very fun stuff that's awesome that's a really fun experience yeah that's cool i still haven't seen a ghost don't know that i want to but uh you're not the new guy in the bar of the hotel who's all like i can't wait to experience something yeah i can't wait to be traumatized by the supernatural right (laughs) (laughs) i think it depends on the kind of experience you have yeah sure i mean if i'm meeting casper that's awesome right how evil (laughs) how evil can a ghost be if they've named it dusty and i'm gonna make your room extra dusty You won't know that the housekeeping even cleaned it. <laughs> Maybe that's just convenient cover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My room is filthy. Oh, dusty. <laughs> well, thank you for listening. We are hard at work on lots of content for the fall for you. We will continue to do one or two episodes in July, one or two episodes in August. 
And please take the time to give us a rating and or review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast service you use to listen to us. Yeah. We will be doing a video segment for Dragon Con under the American Sci-Fi Classics track again this year. That'll be cool. Yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun. I really love working with those folks and we had a lot of fun doing that last year. Other than that, just hang tight. We got a lot of fun stuff coming. Yeah. Looking forward to the fall. Next zine is due out in September. If you are interested in receiving a copy of that zine please email us the best mailing address for you and we will make sure that you get it i will not spill the beans on the giveaway even though i want to so bad we should probably stop recording now (laughs) thanks for listening You've been listening to Arcane Carolinas. Thanks for joining us. If you liked it, give us a rating. Leave a comment. If you didn't like it, send us an email and tell us why. If you're not wrong, we'll try to fix it. And if you're interested in award-winning speculative fiction, including science fiction, urban fantasy, and horror, find me, Michael G. Williams, at www.michaelgwilliamsbooks.com and check out Falstaff Books at falstaffbooks.com. If you'd like to pick up some Arcane Carolinas merch, look at behind-the-scenes info, pictures videos, stuff like that, all the things that get cut, check out arcanecarolinas.com where you can get access to our Patreon, our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram, all that in one place, including the merch store. Buy a shirt. Clothe your body. Drape your body in our wares. Be our living billboards. (laughs) 